Okay, welcome everyone. So we're gonna get started the last session of the week. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Ken, talking about dust and H2 in simulations. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for this nice meeting. Uh, great to be back here after four years and two years of isolation in COVID. Nice to see you all. And uh, so I'll talk about uh, dust and AC treatment in galaxy simulations and how to probe feedback and, uh, uh, with these collaborators, and including our collaboration. And so uh, outline is very simple. Uh, I like to test uh, lambda CDN paradigm and uh, uh, feedback models via structure formation. And uh, to do that, looking at metals and dust distribution in galaxies, CGM, IGM is a good way to do it. So first, I'll talk about dynamical treatment of the dust in hydro simulations, a bit of H2. And then later, if I have time, I'll talk about probing feedback via far infrared lines as well, uh, which is observed by ALMA recently. So that was, as Joel already talked about, a lot of, uh, about this uh, collaboration. One thing I would add is that this uh, collaboration have added kind of framework to our individual works so that uh, our students and the postdoc can get benefit out of this structure that we provide. And uh, uh, yesterday, as I was strolling on the, at the wharf, I discovered this by chance. And uh, I was wondering if actually Joel picked up this idea from, from this uh, inspiration. Uh, but it's a nice picture that, that, uh, that I captured. So. Oh, really? OK, OK. But this is, you know, I can. I, I see. OK, all right. Well, I'm happy to provide this uh, uh, photo to the collaboration. This is my best contribution to the collaboration, I guess. All right, so uh, my group is participating in this uh, collaboration uh, using Gadget 3 code. And here's an example that, that is similar to the one that Yuri talked already, but uh, uh, this isolated galaxy run by our, our code, summarized in Shimizu's 19 paper, and also more, most recently Yuri's 22 paper. We have all the standard uh, physical recipes, uh, such as the cooling by graphical, star formation feedback. And then the chemical enrichment uh, using its uh, chemical evolution library by Saito called Celib. And I'll today talk about this ad uh, further addition as an application to such an such a effort about dust formation destruction coming from this series of paper by Oyama and others. And then we're now uh, we're trying to update this into Gadget 4 uh, code in the future and maybe possibly extend that to CO as well. So this uh, um, uh, effort of implementing dynamical dust treatment in hydro simulation started, I think, around uh, in 2013 by Becky et al. And then they first initially implemented this dust particle into SPH codes, trying to look at the uh, segregation between dust and gas. So they evaluated the pressure, radiation pressure onto dust particles and look at their distribution. And then McKinnon et al. Uh, started this effort in a repo. Initially, they looked at the dust as a scalar uh, field in the repo, and then later switched also to the particle implementation in the repo RT code. And around, uh, around 17, we started this effort in Gadget 3, uh, a few papers by Aoyama on isolated galaxy, and then we also did the cosmological comparison, and uh, Hoetel also did uh, uh, evaluation of extension curves and such. There's an Italian group that's doing similar work. Uh, Granato et al. is doing Zoom simulation using Gadget 3. And then I also mentioned that there's a, a group also doing Gizmo effort. Uh, Lee 19 published a Simba comparison. And then uh, most recently, uh, Dusan's group using Fire 2. Uh, Shoban 22 has, has done the dust work as well. And then now we're doing this Gadget 4, which gives similar results. So people, I think, like this subject because this uh, uh, dust uh, modeling involves very rich physical processes, which I summarized here, coming from the original work by Asano of 13. They basically written down all the formulation that's required to explain these uh, diff different processes. So you first can assume that the dust is produced in supernova and AGB stars, so that will increase the amount of dust. And then that dust is dispersed into ISM, and uh, it can be destroyed in the SN shocks in diffuse environments, so that will decrease the uh, M dust. And then later, uh, a gas phase metal can be accreted onto these dust grains, so that's going to push up the dust mass. And then that's called the grain growth in dense medium with certain time scales that's coming from this modeling. And then the big dust can be shattered after the colliding and then get, can get disrupted. So that's gonna, not going to change the total amount of ma mass of the dust, but it can change the grain size distribution in certain time scales. 
And then the coagulation also takes place. Small dust grains can collide and stick each other, so that also converts the small grains into large grains, so that also has an effect on the grain size distribution, and that's called the sticking in the dense medium, and that's not, not going to change the total amount of dust, but uh, it changes the distribution. Some grains can be also combined into stars, called aspiration. So all these processes uh, play with each other, and in 2015, Hiro Hiroshita in Academia Sinica in Taiwan had a, a very good idea of uh, approximating all this complicated process into a simple two-size approximation. So you see you have this grain size distribution over here from you know, one nanometer to one micron, and you have to treat this entire distribution, and that's a computationally heavy task. So he said, OK, I'm, we're just going to split this into only two bins, small and large. And you can, by doing that, you know, splitting this around 0.02 or 0.03 micron, uh, he can write down this one zone treatment, this, similar to the closed box model of the galaxy, you know, gas evolution, metal distribution, and the only the small dust and large dust. Uh, you can uh, add all these terms for the processes that I descri described in the earlier slide, and, and look at the, the contribution from these two components. And so each processes have different effects on the small and large grain. So it, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. The summer is unstable. And then by, by solving this, uh, he was able to show that this uh, dust to gas ratio as a function of metallicity, uh, it start, you start on this uh, supernova production track. But at some point, it, the nonlinear evolution kicks in and it gradually, uh, uh, rapidly increases to the saturation level. And here, the, the metallicity is acting like a time uh, uh, quantity, uh, and, which is a, a primary uh, physical parameter for this dust evolution. And behind this modeling, there's, of course, a lot of mo model that goes into it. So I'm not going to go into the details of each processes, but each process has its own time scale. So that's the uncertainty that's involved in this modeling. I'll just mention that for the accretion, this is, there's a critical involved in dependence on the metallicity, which gives you this nonlinear evolution at late times, which is re seems to be required to, to reproduce the, the nearby galaxy uh, uh, results. So here's a movie of this uh, dust to gas ratio evolution uh, so for the small dust and large dust and the ratio of it, and also the, on the plane of this uh, D to Z relationship. So initially, you start from this track, uh, a supernova production track, and the large grains form preferentially. And then gradually, the metallicity increases. And at, at some point, you go into this nonlinear growth phase. And then the small, large, large dust gets converted to small dust by shattering. And then the small grains start to, to accrete. So that's going to get this boost. And then goes on to this uh, upper branch where you get to reach to the saturation level. And then the gradually, uh, also small grains now gets converted to large grains uh, um, through this uh, coagulation effect. And so that's going to have also effect on the uh, uh, distribution function. So we later expanded this into this 32 bin treatment, making a more refined treatment of this grain size distribution. But, uh, and then, as you see here, the, the distribution becomes a bit tighter and more clean. But the bottom line, it didn't really change. The qualitative evolution phase is basically confirmed by this uh, uh, finer bin treatment. And two size basically captures the essence of this dust evolution. So as I said, uh, this is like an IMF of, uh, of, for the stars, basically, uh, um, uh, for the dust. And so you produce the, uh, the large grains first from the stellar production. And that's a large grain dominated phase in the first a billion year or so. And then the large grain gets shattered and to large to small grains. So you start to gradually start to crank up the small grains. And then the small grains will grow by accretion. So the normalization will start to come up. And then at the very late phase, the small grains slightly move towards the large grains so that this eventually you will achieve this uh, power law type MRN type grain size distribution. So that's how this. Uh, power law this, uh, grain size distribution comes out uh, as a result of all these different processes. And then the evolution on the extinction curve can also be evaluated. And thanks to these you know, detailed simulations, we can look at dense ISM and diffuse ISM separately, for example. And so depending on the time, they would have different extinction curve. For example, in the beginning, in the diffuse phase, you know, the, the extinction curve is very flat due to only the large grain dominated phase. And on dense, uh, dense ISM, you start to have the small grains, so you gradually start to crank up. And at very late time, you will have this uh, 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 accretion phase where you 
you know, become steeper because of the small grain increase, and you, you will start to reproduce a Milky Way type extension curve. So all of this evolution can be analyzed uh, through the uh, time-varying uh, manner and also dependence on the density and metallicity. All these analysis can be done. We also did this cosmological run in Ho 19 and looked at these processes, and similar thing can be evaluated. Here I'm showing an example of the small uh, grain versus large grain, so a small to large ratio as a function of metallicity. And here on the, on the total sample of the galaxies, you also see similar evolution. Initially, this accretion will bring up this uh, small to large grain ratio. And then later, the coagulation will have a slight decrease in this uh, small to large grain ratio. So this can be observed also in the uh, entire population of galaxies at the same time. And in comparison to local galaxies, uh, there was some hint that this uh, uh, small to large grain ratio, uh, we were reproducing the, the lower bottom of the distribution very well, but there are some galaxy in the local uh, neighborhood that had very high small to large grain ratio. So we're wondering what kind of modification to our models can actually explain this variation here. So one update that we did recently into Gadget 4 uh, by Le Lenny Romano, 22 paper, was to add a treatment of H2 and also diffusion uh, of, the, of the SPH. And uh, you know, uh, here of, uh, before uh, uh, area simulation took care of this uh, diffusion. And so it's a very similar uh, Smarogensky model. And this turbulent diffusion gives an a, a interesting path where you, the, the large grain can be diffusing into the uh, warm diffuse phase so that it can now contribute to the shattering process and increase the small grains at early time. So that allowed us to, to push the small, grain, small to large grain ratio to a, a little bit higher value, uh, explain the, uh, getting a better agreement with the local observation. So having uh, the standard treatment of H2, other people have done this uh, similar work, but considering like processes like photoelectric heating in the stellar region field, and then calculating this H2 formation rate, uh, considering the dust grain side distribution, then uh, considering also the shielding by, uh, of the line of water band, given also the, the dust grain um, distributions, uh, we, we also account for this uh, effect, and then compute the uh, H2 fraction and such. So the diffusion uh, modeling gave us uh, an additional handle to, to control the extension curve. So with this varying degree of diffusion uh, coefficient, we get some variation in the extension curve. But basically, large grain diffusing to low density ISM then gets shattered, so that will increase the sm smaller grain slightly in diffused medium. So that way, you can get a bit, bit steeper extension curve. Okay, here's a comparison to local galaxies, uh, data sample like Jingo and Kingfish and DGS. Etc. So this was done by Monica Rolano, and uh, that's the gas ratio as a function of metallicity you compare to local galaxies, our cosmological results here. And then Lenny's isolated galaxies shows again similar nonlinear evolution here, uh, accounting for this large uh, population here. Okay. So all seems to fall into roughly right place, and uh, more refined treatment can be done further. And one interesting feature that we found in, uh, in the Romano's work is that this small to large grain ratio can be used like a um, chronological uh, uh, timer, uh, just like the, um, the alpha enrichment uh, evolution that we heard uh, yesterday uh, for, for the galactic chemical enrichment. But here you see that the upper branch and lower branch and upper branch is like uh, the highly dust saturated gas in the disk with high dust temperature uh, by accretion process. And later, at late times, so this uh, uh, dense medium, uh, the large grains actually diffuse into low density, diffuse CGM. So that's, uh, 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 this is a CGM gas with low temperature of the dust brought above the disk by diffusion. So that will produce gradually start to appear at late times. So it's similar to uh, chemical enrichment in terms of, for the, this is for the dust. So in the future, if things like this can be observed, uh, it'll be a nice check for a modeling of the small versus large. And then the H2 treatment gave us this type of uh, result, of course. And then uh, uh, by looking at uh, uh, H2 column density as a function of radius, this comparison with local galaxies can be done. Uh, today, uh, with the better data of IFU, you can do this comparison pixel by pixel or radially average profiles. There are some nice data in the, from the fuse and uh, uh, this FH2 uh, fraction versus the column density. Uh, our modeling at different time give you a different H2 fraction. 
as a function of condensity, and all of these can also be compared, and we get the roughly, roughly at the right ballpark, where it makes this huge tra uh, uh, transition to uh, high condensity end um, at late times. Okay, so that's it, and then uh, I will have, I'm showing the cosmological result a little bit. Uh, this is a 15 megaparsec cosmological simulation with earlier models of Ayama, uh, there's a gas distribution, the stars, and the large grains and small grains. More or less, this kind of behaves similar to the isolated galaxy. You first produce a large grains in dense region, and the small grains later gradually catches up in the outer parts and the diffuse environment. So there's no real surprise, but this allows us to uh, discuss the galactic uh, dust distribution, and you can look at the dust mass functions or the total amount of dust in the, in the cosmological space. And one summary plot that was, uh, uh, like you can look at, of course, is this uh, cosmic dust density. And here's a summary plot from the Perot and Hauk and a review uh, 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 article. And in our simulation right now, we kind of overproduce this total amount of dust in the cosmological sense. And the bottom dash curve here is from the Gizmo Simba, Lee 19 work. And uh, we kind of sandwich the uh, current observed data points nicely. So uh, in the future, we can tweak this modeling a little bit more to, to bring this closer to observed data points. One point, of course, is that we don't have explicit Asian strong heating and the suppression of the star's formation. So that will probably bring our, our data point a bit lower in the future. OK, so that's so much about the, the dust treatment. And then in the remaining eight minutes or so, I will uh, talk a bit about the uh, constraint feedback via, via far infrared lines, because this, kind of, this topic of feedback uh, came into discussion in earlier days. So recently, uh, a real multi-wavelength ob observation has been done for the very first high-Z galaxies, uh, about rest of seven or so. You see these O3 emitters or Lyman alpha emitters, uh, Lyman break galaxy, uh, SMGs, they're all observed about rest of seven or so. And uh, we can compare these UV infrared Lyman alpha metal lines uh, comparisons um, and see, see what they're telling us. And of course, as you know, JWST is producing massive results recently. But before JWST came out, uh, there were interesting objects already observed by ALMA. So things like this A1689, Recif 7.5 LBG by Watson, 7, Watson 15, they already saw this uh, object, which has significant amount of dust, 10 to 7 solar mass of dust at Recif 7. And also uh, ALMA auction 3 line detection by Hashimoto and Inoue here, Max 1149. They detected this object at redshift 9.1 um, and suggested that you know, star formation rate of 10 solar masses per year. And looking at the Balmer break of this object, the age of a few hundred mega years suggests that the onset of the star formation was maybe as early as the redshift 15. So even prior to the JWST result, even from just ALMA, uh, there was a hint that the early star formation, the first galaxy, began really early, at, uh, even before this uh, Madal plot did exist at the present time. So it'll be interesting to look at this object and see how they uh, evolve into low Z universe. And here's a movie uh, from our code. Uh, this is the Agora level 12 gadget 3 simulation. It's the same system that Santi was talking about earlier. You see this nice filamentary structure in terms of gas density evolving down to rest of two or so. You see this temperature, um, the cold, you see the cold filaments uh, flowing into the central parts. And at the same time, these uh, hot uh, um, uh, bubbles coming out in between the channels, uh, pr um, carrying also the metals together. So you see this uh, beyond the vir radius, the metals are carried into the CGM and into galactic space. So these should be, these can be studied further. And trying to compare to this ALM observation, we, we, we were doing this uh, uh, modeling of the carbon and oxygen lines. So uh, we redid this uh, radiation transfer calculation called R with using the code called R2 by Lee et al. And then summarized the result in R20 paper. Basically, we reevaluated the ionization of the gas and also assuming photon energy equilibrium. Um, uh, we calculated this uh, O and C abundance. And then uh, detailed balance of these energy levels were evaluated. And that allowed us to produce these maps of Lyman alpha, oxygen lines, and carbon-2 lines. And we looked at the line ratios and the velocity uh, offsets of these lines. One interesting thing we found is that these oxygen lines are more concentrated close to the star forming region from the higher density, higher temperature uh, gas near the star formation. 
where the C2 uh, line was actually coming out from a bit further away, a more diffuse, uh, lower temperature gas. Therefore, um, uh, the ionizing photons can escape perpendicular to these filamentary structures at high rest of the galaxy. Therefore, uh, ionizing photons will uh, propagate into the IGM space uh, in an anisotropic way, which has significant impact on the reionization processes. So velocity offsets of these lines can reveal ionization structure at very early universe, and uh, examining this further will tell us about the reionization process. And other people, of course, have done similar work. And one example here I, I give you is uh, Ramses RT, Sphinx simulations. And there's a lot of progress on this front as well that people can now do on the fly radiation transfer calculation coupled together with the star formation and feedback, which is kind of previously difficult to do. Um, so this, this paper by Katz 19 and 21 evaluate, look at this uh, variation of lines, not just uh, carbon or oxygen, but uh, uh, looking at the uh, implication of the early chemical enrichment. And the sound simulation using a repo is doing something similar by Kanan Garaldi, uh, also looking at uh, uh, radiation transfer in early universe. One result uh, that's interesting to look at is this uh, uh, UV versus carbon-2. In a paper by Huizmoto 19, they discovered there's a significant difference between this uh, uh, HST stacking UV light versus the carbon-2. Uh, this is an artistic impression, but this red part is the extended carbon-2 line. And when you look at this in terms of data, the, the carbon-2 line has a very extended uh, uh, a shallow tail relative to the two simulations that we compared against. So here's a, a Ramses Alcea simulation from the Italian group, and the bottom one is SP simulation from our group. Both simulations actually fail to produce these very extended uh, tail to the out outskirts. So this may suggest that we might be still missing some kind of mechanism of wide carbon enrichment in the early universe, or, and also what powers emission is an interesting question that we uh, need to answer. Similar thing has been done also for the magnesium-2 lines at lower redshift, around redshift 2 or so. Uh, here's a result from Megaflow, uh, where they looked at this uh, uh, bipolar outflow uh, in emission in the MG2 line, and also compared to simulation modeling and nicely uh, recovering their uh, observation result. And also, uh, a TNG-50 simulation can also give you a similar result. Nelson-21 gave you uh, this profile. And similarly to the C2 line, uh, the observed data looks a bit more uh, extended and shallow compared to the simulation profiles. So this again seems to suggest that the feedback effects might not be uh, perfect here. And we can try to push this further, um, trying to look at the effects of the feedback. So um, uh, Yuri already talked about this a bit, but Hu19 uh, trying to simulate this dwarf galaxy, resolving re really down to the stellar level with the one solar mass resolution and 0.3 parsec resolution, they were able to look at the expanding uh, bubble, super bubbles emanating from the dwarf galaxy. And these bubbles uh, uh, percolate and erupt from the galactic disk, eventually producing this warm outflow from, this, from the surface of the galaxy without too much assumptions on the subgrid level. An interesting thing is that they predict uh, the winds that are much weaker than what cosmologists usually adopt in our cosmological simulation through the kinetic, wind, kinetic mode of the wind. So that's something that we need to continue to look and evaluate what would be the best subgrid models. And somebody asked earlier that, what about comparing to small scale simulations? So uh, these type of ISM simulation can resolve much finer details on the smaller scales. So here's an example from Kim Ostreicher uh, looking at the four parsec scales. And they also uh, look at, uh, find this multi-phase uh, outflow from galactic plane, and basically it's a cutout simulation, but you can resolve the fast moving low density outflow, and also as well as if some, some of the warm component comes back and then goes, uh, contributes to star formation, et cetera, et cetera. So this interface on the smaller scales and, and the um, subgrid model that we do is still an issue uh, with, that we have to continue to evaluate. Okay, so I'll just put the summary here, the simple the introduction of an extension of Agora effort on the dust formation destruction, and a high Z uh, galaxy, good testing lab for the, uh, for the feedback effects, and the multi-phase outflow is still uh, an issue. And so the, I'll just point out this uh, 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 continuing problem of the interface between the super bubble, how do they interact with the local ISM is an issue. And then I didn't talk about aging feedback at all, but this is even more complicated and uncertain. 
how, they, how are they launched, and how they propagate into the CGM space is, is uh, uh, um, still uh, a lot of work has to be done. And then also the cosmic rays, yeah. Okay, thank you, I'll stop here. Any questions? Okay. Oops. Yes, Joe. Uh, well, it's an amazingly complete discussion of creation, transformation, and destruction of dust. Uh, and you mentioned radiative transfer, but you didn't show any images of galaxies, including the radiative transfer. Uh, have you been uh, using yeah. that to, to actually run? Uh, right. Uh, we mm -hmm. also. Uh, do you understand the origin of the Calzetti extinction curve? The observers uh, okay. are very happy with some version of Calzetti. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the, do your dust models actually produce what observers think is your typical extinction curve, both uh, nearby and even out to high redshift? Right, and right. And there are yes. other features uh, like uh, the UV bump, uh, which may be connected with solar. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, can you discuss? Uh, sure, sure, sure. To which you're yeah, introducing sure. those features. Right. So for the for the first question of the images, uh, we can of course use radiation transfer code like Sunrise or Skirt, and uh, we have done some exercise of that, uh, but haven't really published any of that result yet. But that gives us some contrast between the intrinsic extinction versus the attenuation curve, and that also has uh, good information for the observers. And uh, uh, second part, um, Calzetti, uh, we have to go to cosmological zoom run to address, really address that to, and apply a modeling to cosmological calculation. But uh, the cosmological run that we did so far was very crude resolution, so we didn't have resolution to really address the internal structure of the galaxy. So eventually we want to do the cosmological zoom run with our dust modeling with Gadget 4, uh, updated model, and then res res resolve the internal structure. And then, and then we can address whether the high-Z star-forming galaxy can, uh, uh, can have the causality extension model set. So that, that's coming, uh, but uh, yeah, it requires a bit more work on our, on our end, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Another question about the extinction curves. You showed the, the UV bumps there. Do those come from a simple parameterization related to the small dust particles, or is there an actual physical model for pH creation or ah. something like that? Well, um, yes, uh, uh, it's it's a modeling. It's a model that comes from the small grains, and uh, so. Uh, but we do, we can we can we we had a one version of the model that con considered the, the the carbonaceous versus the. Uh, silicate uh, modeling, so so that contrast can be included into our uh, modeling, so that can also contribute this bump. So, but it's it's part of the modeling, and uh, so I, I wouldn't say it's an intrinsic uh, result of the calculation, uh, but you can add some refinement to our modeling to to account for this bump. Yeah. Another question. So uh, my, my question is, we've been doing a lot of work on modeling things like dust dynamics on micro scales. So I'm curious, from these kinds of studies, what's the most interesting thing you would say would be useful from those kinds of studies? What would you like to know about sort of you know, micro scale dust dust or dust gas interactions or things like that? Are there things that contribute significantly to the destruction or growth rates that are uncertain? Well, I think uh, even the current models can, can roughly explain how the entire population of dust grows and, and, and evolve in terms of distribution function. So that, that part, I think, it is satisfactory already at some level, to some level. But uh, interaction radiation, for example, is, is, an, is a difficult uh, issue. And eventually would have implication on the star formation as well, right? And so it's not completely self-consistent at this point. You know, we're kind of doing the dust modeling on one hand and star formation feedback separately, so eventually it has to be all tied in together to, to be, to be self-consistent, right? So that's really challenging, as you of course know. Uh, so so uh, those coupli coupling of these processes can eventually bring us in more complete picture of star formation and obscured galaxies and everything, right? So to understand star formation feedback, I think this is also a necessary effort towards the future. And then once it all comes together, we'll have you know, complete picture of the dusty galaxy formation uh, at the same time, I think. 
So, so I think that's all towards that final goal of achieving this uh, complete modeling of star formation feedback. Um, so that's it's only one part of that. But uh, for observers, it, it's an important aspect, right? Because it changes the SED completely, and uh, how a galaxy looks, it really d depends on this uh, dust evolution. So I think it's really a necessary component of the modeling to, to account for the comparison between simulation and observation eventually. Yeah. OK, so you can take a very quick question while Brian sits. You can set up. Okay. I know. OK. Any other question?